Thank you for joining our product vision for 2024 webinar. Uh, we have about an hour's worth of content. We'll have some questions at the end. Um, if you could move along, are you, you're controlling the slides Bryce, for us. Yeah, so we'll have uh, some sections by myself. Uh, hi, I'm Anka Baji. I'm the CTO and co-founder. If you haven't met me before, we also have Tassos, our lead blockchain engineer, joining us to talk us through some of the network roadmap, Ross, who's been doing some of the introductions already as senior product manager, and Alex Tweedale, who will be covering off some of the work that we're doing on standards and our SaaS solutions. Um, but we also wanted to acknowledge, like, you know, a lot of people who are on this call today, we're not going to be speaking. Uh, there's a very big and brilliant team behind the magic at Checked. Um, uh, who are behind this. It's not just the product and engineering team, um, as well as the developers that we have. So just wanted to give a shout out and call out to some of the other people who, who make this happen year in, year out. So what are we going to cover? We look at some of the product reflections that we had on what we achieved in 2023. Um, a reminder of like, you know, what we are trying to do over here at Checked looking into our 2024 product roadmap and goals and diving into it. Uh, these will be various sections run by Tassos, Ross and Alex. And then I'll finally round it off with a couple of thoughts about uh, something we want to call experiments, um, emerging sort of areas of applications of decentralized identity that we feel quite excited about. So moving along to what did we achieve last year? Um, I think it took me even a while to uh, round everything up. There's there's a lot more than these five broad categories that we've mentioned. But just to cover off, we launched version one of our node and our network, um, which brought with itself more economically viable identity and utility pricing. Um, in 2022, we had launched something called uh, decentralized ID or did linked resources. We had a much improved version of that with uh, versioning support and a lot more advancements that we had in version one of our network. And we brought along a lot more delegators. Obviously, some of them uh, left our network as validators, but we also brought along newer validators and launched the Czech Community DAO. The biggest thing that we are proud of is from the very first day that we launched in uh, the as a company back in 2021, we've been talking about how in self-sovereign identity or decentralized identity, there's a bit of a business model problem where people need to be able to charge and pay for credential exchanges. And we absolutely delivered on that USP in a very decentralized, privacy-preserving fashion, which is pretty unique to our network. And to expand on that, uh, instead of just paying for such credential exchanges and check tokens, uh, we also did a proof of concept on how we could do it with fiat to fiat. We launched something called credential as a service or credential service placeholder name that gives you all of the things that we have in points number one and two and gives it as a simplified developer experience as a SaaS product. So you can get started with decentralized identity and payment rails. That's for all the app developers out there. And the proudest achievement within that is we have a partnership with Verida Network that builds a decentralized ID wallet and Finclusive, who are a KYC provider, to really be able to issue KYC credentials at scale. And we'll, we'll see more about that this year, hopefully. Um, and then the we also had a big sort of like you know leap that we took into consumer facing products. We had, so far had been a very business to business B two B solution. We're building stuff for developers, but we felt there was a bit of a gap in the market for the kinds of user experiences that we wanted to build. So we launched Creds.xyz, which is our take on a portable, secure, and private reputation system for Web three point oh where people can hold their Web 3.0 reputations in an end-to-end -end encrypted digital ID wallet that is fully within their control and with mechanics that are a bit more NFT-like. And we also launched something called Creator Studio, which allows communities and individuals to go issue credentials to people. 
there's a lot more developments happening happening on that, which I'm excited Ross will talk you through. And then finally, to acknowledge some of the industry accolades that we've been uh, picking up. So we got the we came second as startup of the year at the European Blockchain Conference, and we were also ranked at amongst the top hundred UK startups. Um, there's there's a lot of other industry feedback, partnerships, etc. That where we've um, gotten to hear people like enjoying and building to start solu building solutions on top of our network. So where we go on to the next slide is to just recap, um, looking back at those past three years, I think 2022 for us was a lot about let's build the foundational basics. Let's build the software development kits or SDKs as they're called and launch some of the basic functionality. In 2023, we delivered on the payment rails that, we, that a lot of our tokenomics is built upon. We built SaaS tools and creds.xyz. Where we are looking at in 2024 is the next generation of our check network ledger, which will bring with it improved tokenomics and liquidity and improvements to identity features. We want to improve our SaaS tools, whether that be credential service or within creds.xyz create a studio to bring digital credentials to far more developers and far more users and a much broader vision for where we want to take creds.xyz, not just looking at Web 3.0 reputation, but looking at it more holistically as all of your on-chain data, all of your off-chain data, and what, could, what kind of uh, features could be enabled with that. And on a personal note, I think it was uh, very exciting to get the entire team together, except for one person who couldn't make it together at Cosmoverse. I think it was, um, we we are a company that started in the COVID-19 pandemic, so we hadn't necessarily had the chance to all meet each other. And we went to a lot of conferences, we had a lot of fun, and a lot of this is not just about the products that we're building, but the friends that we made along the way. The picture in the center is the uh, entire checked team that you saw earlier on the slides. And on the bottom left is us having a spicy ramen noodle eating competition, which definitely made me cry. On that note, over to the next section where we will talk through the various different work streams. So we'll talk about check network. We'll talk about our ecosystem and credentials as a service. We'll talk about creds and our experimentations that we're doing. So first up, over to uh, looking through what some of those goals are. So at a high level overview, if you move along to the next slide, Ross, you can go and see some of the product roadmap for yourself. I am not sure if it's gone live on the website yet already or not. But yeah, it's you, live. Yeah. It's live. Okay, perfect. If you, you can browse through this at your own leisure or if you scan the QR code if you're on the Zoom webinar. What we'll talk you through is the six specific goals that we have in mind. So if you could move along, we want to talk about how we enhance check network through tokenomics improvements and identity functionality, um, keeping up to date with the standards and the industry best practices to maintain product differentiation. We are already one of the most compliant decentralizing ID networks with our protocol, and we support the largest number of credential formats. But we want to give an update on the further things that we want to go and expand there. Uh, moving on to credential as a service, we want to talk about how we want to simplify our SaaS product over there with a simplified dashboard for developers, as well as feature additions for regulated payment schemes. And then a deep dive into creds where we talk about how collectors can earn and collect more credentials by aggregating their data from various different sources, how creators can gain insights into their communities and build more personalized experiences, products, and services, and what else can collectors do besides displaying their credentials, which is what we do for now. And so on that note, I will hand over to Tassos the real Tassos, not the fake Tassos, <laughs> who clicked the wrong link to join the Zoom webinar, who will talk us through all of the Czech network developments. Tassos, over to you. Hello, everyone. I'm Tassos, lead engineer, Czech, uh, and I'm 
going to walk you through the uh, uh, tech networks uh, key goals uh, for 2024. Uh, essentially, we want to uh, enhance uh, the economics and the identity functionality, uh, mostly driving utility and uh, unlocking, unlocking new uh, foundations, uh, benefiting uh, adoption, greater adoption, and uh, allowing more use cases to be developed on top of the uh, of those uh, foundations. Uh, so yeah, moving on though, uh, let's take a look at the current network uh, capabilities. Uh, first of all, uh, implementers can issue credentials and uh, generate presentations uh, uh, with a fully uh, W3C uh, data model uh, conformant uh, in three major credential uh, formats. JSON, JSON LD, and Anon creds, uh, otherwise known as uh, ZK creds. Uh, the first of its kind uh, uh, charging for credentials as well, uh, being able to set up uh, status lists, publish them as big linked resources, and gating them uh, with certain payment con conditions uh, for now, uh, and setting basically a price to uh, verify the credential status. Um, then uh, it's all about creating, updating, and deactivating decentralized identifiers, uh, fully uh, spec compliance to the W3C bit core, uh, utilizing checks, uh, unique bit method, uh, creating status lists, uh, essentially the uh, unencrypted uh, version, uh, uh, or the encrypted one being able to charge with the previous the, uh, Entry points and yeah, basically just creating uh, any uh, type or uh, certain, let's say, uh, use case specific uh, uh resource. Okay, so uh, moving on, let's uh, check uh, what's on our immediate plans. Essentially, we want to improve tokenomics uh, for greater utility and network sustainability. Uh, first of all, raising gas and transaction prices uh, for uh, impactful uh, identity transactions and uh, to complement the credential application check travelers uh, with payments, uh, mostly to allow capturing more value uh, within the protocol for payments, as mentioned. And yeah, basically, since the current prices are running at the standard level, which is basically uh, low uh, from our observations. And then moving on, uh, we're trying to start away the uh, base fee payment distinction, um, just expanding uh, to the IBC enabled uh, ecosystem in Cosmos and beyond, and to be able to include stable coin logic uh, that can utilize and resolve to the tech token, essentially. Uh, on that note as well, we want to expand uh, further to, uh, on our initial uh, pricing model for identity transactions and bring uh, deflationary actions to all basic uh, interactions with Ledger while maintaining the usual uh, deflationary action and uh, Lock reward equilibrium. And then uh, we are aiming to enable additional DeFi segment layers and payment models that includes uh, more advanced uh, escrow uh, logic and uh, embedding stable points uh, additionally. That's mostly to uh, be able to bring on more consortia and be allowing for uh, more advanced and, and more in numbers uh, business. Yeah, so moving on, we also want to be able to generate uh, in protocol revenues through MEV. Essentially, the classic MEV model is uh, the one that's pictured here. Um, and based on that, there's not much control that the protocol uh, can have based on that, uh, and usually layer ones as blockchain networks. So we are aiming to uh, implement uh, skip protocols, block SDK, to have greater control 
over uh, MEV, which is basically the maximal uh, value extraction that we can have within the protocol. And uh, we also have some kind of uh, priority to transactional uh, loads within the mempool, allowing for the aforementioned uh, revenue and giving more control to the protocol. And moving on. Um, on the next generation, which is the first version two of uh, set network, uh, we uh, are actually uh, getting there by uh, upgrading Cosmos SDK eventually to uh, 47, uh, which is the next major line of uh, versions. And uh, finally to version 0 0.50, uh, enabling those uh, improvements and features uh, out of the box. Uh, and notably the ABCA++ uh, uh, pool set, which is uh, basically uh, one of the major breakthroughs uh, allowing allowing for allowing uh, programmable consensus, uh, basically unlocking the use cases uh, depicted here, uh, which is on chain governance with soft chain uh, verifiable data, rightful encryption, and parallel execution, which are all concepts that uh, help the, uh, the greater utility captured through uh, payments on the network. And yeah, moving on. Um, we also have the ongoing work through proposal 31, which is community pool funded, where community pool spends as voted and inherited by the community, by uh, executed by NimLab, essentially enabling uh, the linked resources uh, on Ledger over IBC to all IBC enabled chains. Uh, uh, bringing uh, this uh, tech specific functionality to uh, Cosmos Chains and beyond uh, for greater adoption utility and bringing on uh, uh, more uh, use cases, uh, signaling a new era of uh, decentralized apps and sustainable business models. Uh, this is the model uh, depicted here uh, with. Uh, the scheme of, uh, of approver and verifier, uh, basically all of that being uh, ZK creds, as mentioned as well, bringing all of this logic on chain. Um, and yeah, the motto here is just empowering uh, decentralized networks through self sovereign identity, which is the point here. And yeah, based on that, I'm passing the torch to Alex. Thanks. Thanks, Tassos. That was you know, a really good sort of rundown of some of the core network functionality and utility we're going to be building next year. Very excited to see that as it's sort of the core linchpin for everything that we're building on top of it. Um, but next, I'm going to run you through some of the core sort of ecosystem uh, work that we're going to be looking at in the next year, specifically around different standards and protocols. Um, Ross, if you move to the next slide quickly. Uh, that we're going to be supporting on the network to min maintain product differentiation. I think the really cool thing, Ross, if you move to the next up, yeah, that we're going to be looking at is 2024, hopefully is going to be the year that EIDAS 2, which is a regulation that was passed in, uh, well, the, the, the final text was passed in the EU last year. Hopefully this is going to start kickstarting verifiable credential adoption across the EU and then hopefully globally. This is pretty exciting for Czech specifically, as in the final text, uh, there was actually a section on electronic ledgers included, which means that these will be able to be, to be used as trust services within the context of EIDAS. So that gives not only us a lot more certainty around the sort of parameters we can operate in, but it gives certainty to our customers as well, saying, you know, we can actually use checks with confidence in the confines of this new regulation. And on to the next slide, Ross. What we're going to be focusing on, particularly at Checked, is aligning ourselves with these standards and protocols that were specified within EIDAS and also the European Architecture and Reference Framework. So we want to position ourselves to be a qualified electronic ledger under the new EIDAS framework. 
and jumping through the hoops to actually get that certification, working closely with the EU to make sure that we fall into that category. We're also going to be working with friends in the industry. So we've got lots of partners here, such as Animo Solutions, WallTID and Sperion. All of these companies are building different software on top of the network and for different networks. And they're looking to support the EU sort of standards and protocols for credential exchange. So the one that you might come across more frequently is OpenID for verifiable credential issuance and, and presentation. So having those supported and having checked as the sort of base layer and then those OpenID for verifiable credential support, a protocol supported on top is going to be a key priority for 2024. Uh, within Veramo, which is our primary SDK and also uh, Aries Framework JavaScript, which is now renamed to Credo. Uh, yeah, and Ross, moving on to the next slide. I think strategically, somewhere that we really want to position checked this year is being sort of functionally aligned with the European Blockchain Service Infrastructure, or otherwise known as EBSI. So where checked will be, uh, so where EBSI sort of will be issuing credentials for largely governments working with member states, we want to position checked as the sort of equivalent enterprise arm, being able to facilitate payment use cases uh, for those companies that EBSI potentially is not able to, to cover. Um, and by ensuring interoperability with EPSI at the sort of protocol and credential type layer, we will be able to have sort of, sort of functional equivalents. And we look forward to potentially collaborating further with them for the next year. Um, on to the next slide, please, Ross. Um, and on top of the sort of network and the standards that we're building comes our sort of first main product, I would like to say. And... This year with credential service, I think one of the core things for me is really focusing around solving real user problems in the market um, to gain real life adoption in, pro in production environments. Um, and to do this, it's gonna be around simplifying the user experience for implementers um, and taking what we've built already with, uh, with credential payments and bringing it into regulated industries, and also payment schemes, which I'll discuss a bit later. Um, onto the next slide, please, Ross. So I started off by thinking, what actual problems do we want to solve here with credential service? Um, so I, I went through a couple of user stories of where I think the value could really lie. So firstly, it's like, as an enterprise company, I want to be able to monetize the data that I hold or data that I'm required to share within a, an existed federated data scheme or consortia so I can make sustainable revenue from this model. Currently, it's really difficult for companies to actually monetize data that they exchange. Either they're required to do it under some sort of regulation or they're already in a closed loop system. So actually adding a, a monetization model to these existing networks is going to be a huge sort of problem solver going into the next year. We'll talk about that a bit more later. Um, secondly, as a digital service provider, we want to reduce friction for onboarding and verifying new customers so we can save money, time, and provide customers with a better user experience. Currently, you know, I think people on this call understand the value of verifiable credentials, but actually demonstrating in that in real sort of production environments of how these can like reduce friction in the onboarding process and working with Finclusive and Verida, as I'll touch on later, is going to be crucial to achieving this goal. And finally, another sort of problem that I think we can solve is as an enterprise company, I am exploring issuing verifiable credentials to my customers, and I want to meet these new re upcoming regulations within the EU. But currently, it's too complicated to, to integrate these SSI credential things into my existing application. So hopefully, credential service can act as that nice, easy medium for these companies to actually comply with the EIS2 um, and support credential payments on top of that. Um, on to the next slide, please, Ross. So, Going through a couple of user stories and sort of our hypothesis for how we solve these problems, I think I've come up with a couple of thoughts where I, I think to say, you know, if we make data natively reusable, we can improve user experience and personalization. If we establish payment rails for credentials, we can create new revenue streams for data sharing. And if we integrate simply into your existing application, we can save development time, resources, effort. Um, and finally, if we meet existing upcoming regulatory hurdles, we can future-proof your application. 
So these are you know stories for issuers that will actually hugely benefit their existing applications and provide tangible value in the market. Similarly, for credential verifiers, if we do exactly the same things, you know, we can start to lower costs for people consuming credentials. We can undercut the current costs of identity verification providers, which is huge because a lot of companies can't enter the market of verifying their customers because it's prohibitively expensive. So if we you know, bring in credential payments here into that market, we open up new verticals, we open up new markets. And for the user side as well, we create new personalized user journeys where via credentials, people can share extra preference data, go on new sort of user journey paths, which they weren't able to necessarily go on before um, and position companies as leaders in the market in line with the new EIDAS regulations as well. Um, on to the next slide, please, Ross. So credential service and putting all of that context to one side is, is really a product that helps you issue, verify, and monetize reusable data through easily consumable production-ready APIs in order to solve a suite of industry problems in a very simple way. Um, and onto the next slide, please, Ross. Um, and I touched on earlier, something that we're really proud of is actually starting to get credentials into the wild. I think one of the biggest types of credentials that we've seen demand for uh, over the last year has been KYC credentials and actually proving that you are a, a real person reusing that trust within financial services or going from a Web2 organization into a Web3 organization. So with Binclusive, what we've built is they've integrated our APIs for issuance, also for supporting status lists. We can issue credentials to the Verida wallet and have people present those credentials to third parties. And we're working with a multitude of financial services to actually show um, a flow of, you know, basically KYC reliance with those third parties. And what's almost unique in the market to check is because of how we have on ledger status lists, those third parties can get real time status information on the credentials, which is much more up to date than just relying on the static credential that they've been presented. And I think we have found that particularly compelling as we go to market with this product. Um, I think also moving into 2024, we're going to be focus, focusing more on payment rails, um, specifically within the inclusive use case, but also more broadly. Um, and just to quickly touch on what we've built here with payment rails, it's actually a model where verifiers will be able to pay multiple issuers in one flat fee, and that fee can cascade back to multiple issuers. So it's incredibly flexible in how it can be used and plugging gaps in, in, in the industry, because as I mentioned earlier, in lots of you know federated sort of data schemes at the moment, there's no payment payment or revenue model. And if you can start to layer in credential payments on top of things like that, you can actually start to really kickstart um, data markets. And self-sovereign identity is really perfectly aligned to that because the data flows through the individual. So the issuer and verifier need to actually establish trust between each other. And having that credential payments model allows people to almost pay for trust. So I think that's going to be something that we see as really compelling. Similarly, with credential payments, we've designed this in a way where multiple verifiers uh, can pay and, and si at the same time, concurrently, a payment can flow back to the issuer. Um, and this is important because it we've built this in a highly scalable way. So we should be able to support you know, tens of thousands of transactions per second on the network, which is you know in line with your MasterCard and your visas. And we really see this as the sort of payments layer that goes on top of data sharing and identity transactions to support sort of this next iteration of trusted data markets, as we like to call it. Um, and on that exact point, we've been exploring a lot in the last six months, and we will be going into 2024, the idea of bringing credential payments into what are, known, what are called payment schemes. So a payment scheme uh, in a nutshell is essentially just a payment system which has an organizational body which sets the which basically says this is the technical infrastructure for the scheme and these are the rules that the service providers within the scheme must follow and um, they're generally run by organizations known as payment scheme operators um, and the important thing about schemes is they work in the real world so 
if we want to bring prudential payments to regulated industries, to financial services, working within existing payment schemes is going to be incredibly important. Um, next slide, please, Ross. So a model that we've been exploring is how an or organization two can pay organization one, but actually they don't interface with the check network. They don't touch blockchain. They don't touch necessarily our check token directly, but by interfacing with the scheme, they're still able to use a, com a, a currency that they're comfortable with to pay to verify credential and the organization one can actually be paid for issuing that credential. And just really simply how that would work is organization two would pay into the payment scheme operator. The payment scheme operator would actually trigger the on-chain sort of check payment to decrypt the uh, status list to return that to organization two. So organization two is now able to say, okay, I can verify that this credential is valid in real time. I've paid you know, my $10 or my $1 or, or however much the scheme wants to charge for this to verify that. And then the payment scheme also pays themselves in check and then pays out to organization one in a stable coin or fiat currency. This could be either you know, USD, it could be euros, or it could be um, a stable coin version of USD or euros. And I know that you know lots of markets in the EU are now looking at um, EURC, so uh, basically a, a stable coin version of the euro. Um, and I think we'd be interested in supporting markets where you could use check under the hood as an accounting mechanism, but you could settle um, with rules and you know particular particular scheme rules within a stable currency. Uh, on to the next slide, please, Ross. So wrapping this all together and sort of fi like finishing off on the credential service side um, to make this really usable and easy for our customers in the next year, we want to be bundling all of our APIs, all of this functionality into easy to use dashboards. Um, this is a mock-up that I put together of what it could start to look like. So as a developer, you can manage access to the platform, you can manage your API keys. Um, and hopefully on here, we can start to show you know, balances that you accrue from uh, you know, making money from credentials and also balances that you need to pay for verifying credentials as well. And the final thing that I would love everyone's help on this call is we would love to give credential service a bit of a new, a new name and new look. And we're going to be opening this up to the community and the partners and everyone listening. We want to give it a flashy name uh, that people really resonate with. I particularly like Casio. I think that sounds quite fun. It's like credentialasaservice.io. But I think after this call, we'll re we're really open to suggestions around uh, you know, people saying, oh, I think you should run with this name for this reason. So supercharging credential service with new additions and a new name is going to be one of the core sort of uh, concepts for this coming year. And that probably wraps up my section and I will pass neatly on to Ross to chat through everything on creds. Brilliant. Thanks, Alex. Yeah, segue into creds, which stole the stole the name creds from what could have been credential service. So, um, so yeah, I'll take everyone through three different goals that are all focused on creds. As a reminder, creds is our consumer application. It all started out as a bit of a demo um, at the start of last year, literally January 2023, where we wanted to find a way to, as the slide earlier said, show, not tell. So show people how self-sovereign identity and DID works rather than trying to explain it. Because I think one of the things that anyone in this call from the industry will know is trying to explain self-sovereign identity, even the word itself does often get met with difficulty and some sort of mystified looks. And so cred started out as that, but it's obviously evolved somewhat more into a consumer application for building a reputation and, and we'll take you through that. So the first goal of what we want to kind of focus on with creds is enabling the aggregation of more data, of more credentials. And so we want the collectors, which are basically our users, the people that are using the app itself, to be able to collect and earn more credentials and be able to build their reputation from more places. So kind of to take through a bit of like the, the philosophy of where this comes from is currently our reputation is everywhere on the internet. We have a reputation in the different social media sites we use. We also have a reputation in the ways we engage in um, sports, in travel, in um, all different kind of ways in which we kind of have a, a, a our own sort of uh, score. 
in the Web3 world, we also have different reputation. We have our reputation in the wallets that we use in the NFT marketplaces that some people use, not so many now. And so there's this reputation which is kind of scattered and all over the place. And additionally, as your reputation becomes more scattered, as your reputation and your data becomes harder to manage, there's an increasing risks of it being misused because it's obviously not under your control. And this really does go to the heart of what self-sovereign identity is all about and, and the kind of the founding ideas that Fraser and Andanka started everything off with, which is people should know what their data is, and but most importantly, be able to control what data is seen. Um, and you may have seen this brilliant ad that came out um, kind of talking about the risks around data and the amount of data that exists and how that can be used against people is when the emergence of, of AI and people being able to kind of have models and things being able to mislead their families and so forth. Um, so yeah, I'd really recommend checking out this, this if you haven't seen it. So where does that lead us in terms of creds? So the way of thinking about it is this exact question, what if it was possible to see more of your reputation, but all in one place and all under your control? So all of us, we are one person, we really have one reputation and it should all be in one place. And that's exactly what the creds wallet kind of intends to be. So a way with this goal is all about finding new ways of exposing the APIs that enable you to issue into creds and make it possible for people to bring their reputation into one place. And how this looks in terms of kind of increasing trust is as an individual, you can have different levels, different credentials, which attest to your trustworthiness. And if we think about kind of the trust and the trust equation, you know, one thing that's been talked about before is, is trust is very much about your credibility, your reliability, and so forth. And so being able to have higher credit, higher sort of assurance credentials, things like biometric identifiers and birth certificates, and being able to build up a wallet that contains those, but also lower things, things that kind of more just um, your reputation data, which is maybe not as high trust, but having it all in one place gives you the opportunity to, to build a reputation and, and build it over time. And so how are we doing this? Um, there's a number of organizations which we're kind of exploring. These are not cemented partnerships. So there's no, no kind of like clear partnerships on this, but these are kind of the kind of organizations that we're um, in conversations with and, and trying to see where this could go. So on the Web2 side, there's data providers which basically enable um, individuals to choose what data they want to come out of the platforms they're using, be it Uber, be it something on Google, be it whatever. You know, for me, I've always been interested in just boring the team to death around Strava and Whoop and different types of sports data, but being able to bring that all into one place. And so I have one unified reputation. And so using providers um, like Reclaim Protocol, for example, can help do that. And then additionally, being able to blend that reputation with um, Web3 data providers. So organizations that index on-chain uh, data, which basically means they just get events, things that people do using uh, their wallets on-chain and bring those activities into one place. And so that kind of blended reputation, and we'll come on to how that can, can improve the user experience for the users over time as well. So that first goal, aggregation, enabling people to build their reputation as a user, as a collector side of it. Goal five then kind of looks more at the creators. And the creators for us is essentially issuers of credentials. Um, and so like we, we kind of use the term creator for creds rather than issuers, but we felt it was more in line with the narrative within Web3 and, um, and the space already. With creators, we want to give opportunities for them to build better, more engaged, more personalized journeys from their members. And to do so, they need to have more insights. And so we want to provide insights to creators but in a privacy preserving way that respects the kind of um, anonymity, but also consent of those that are collecting the credentials. And this very much touches on airdrops or um, airdrops. If you haven't come across the space, if you're not kind of working daily in Web3 or haven't come across these, they're essentially incentivized community engagement campaigns. They're a way of gaining engagement from new um, and existing community members um, by rewarding people in your token, in your cryptocurrency token. The problem is, and um, we've seen time and time again, and, and we experienced some of our own challenges roughly two years ago with an airdrop, which we could share more on, but I think we've we've bought, bought that one. Um, but this is something we, we, which we've seen a lot, and Fraser's been meeting with a lot of um, VCs, a lot of people recently who have been saying again and again that this is a real problem. Um, Masari Data, which is a massive organization which does a lot of um, analysis and a conference that we attended in New York, did an analysis which basically showed that actually an individual is better off selling all their airdrop tokens than they are holding them over time, which basically just kind of encourages this attitude of airdrop hunting. Um, we also have like Sybils and people who are basically just creating multiple accounts or fake accounts and just grabbing um, airdrops. 
and more and more there's this um understanding beyond just web3 but also just into the general kind of startup ecosystem which is that incentivization if it's not done in a personalized way and if it's not done directly kind of focusing on the users that you want to engage with it just doesn't work and over long term it's going to not be good for um for your longevity of your project so finding genuine methods, uh, members is what matters. Um, finding people that you believe will stick around. We've got a community now of ambassadors. We've got a large community, but we've got some ambassadors of up to sort of 10 people now who are completely committed, oh, completely committed to our project and our mission. Um, and you'll see things like uh, things on Twitter. You'll see people engaging and sharing with us. So finding the ones that matter is important. We are less interested in people who are using, you know, YouTube vids like this one, how to earn 10 grand off doing some crypto airdrops or basically the airdrop farmers who are claiming to be investors and people who are managing, you know, in the crypto space when really they're just hunting down the next project and selling it as fast as they can. So how are we doing this? So with creds, we're making it easier for organizations to gain insights into their community members. Um, and we're doing so through a blend of uh, what we're calling quests, uh, which is basically learning journeys and, and journeys that organizations, creators can build to learn more about their community, learn, learn more about their members, but do so in a way that kind of respects their privacy and allows them to consent to um, sharing information. In that same vein, we'll also allow people to have analytics so they can start to analyze which credentials are getting claimed, who's claiming them, um, and then be able to reward them more informed and so creating kind of personalized learning journeys. And the way we kind of think about this, and um, this is a conversation I had earlier, Fraser, with, which kind of helped us piece this together, is kind of thinking of this sort of engagement flywheel or this community engagement flywheel, whereby we start kind of on the far left with discovery. A new member finds out about a project they care about. They find some level of interest that aligns to their um, personal interests. For example, for Checked, it would be around privacy. It would be around personal like, um, identity and things so forth. And then from that discovery, they begin to engage. So they engage with quests, for example, they read docs, they start to attend things like these webinars. And in doing so, the project themselves can then begin, begin to recognize them. They can recognize them for what they've um, supported, how they've supported us, like the many ambassadors that we've had. And they can get that sense of understanding and part of the tribe that is, say, checked, for example. And then over time, because we've seen that and we've understood that, we see the value organizations like checked and others can then begin to reward them and so we have this kind of virtuous cycle where eventually you kind of have engagement recognition and rewards but the positive thing for that in terms of community growth and and i guess what some people call growth hacking is at that same time where that person that individual is staying within that loop of engagement recognition rewards they're then advocating for the project as well they're sharing things on social media they're talking to friends about it they're saying this is a great project check it out and it encourages more members to engage discover and kind of we have that continuous cycle of better members, more engaged members with real recognition, earning rewards that they deserve, helping bring other good members in. And then that kind of same flywheel can, can work on the actual creator side. So organizations, community moderators that are building um, communities have that same thing. So community establishes itself, they encourage members to engage, they can do an internal like analysis. So they can use quests, they can use different management tools that we're kind of providing within creds. And in doing so, they can tailor better experiences, which encourage people to engage more and so forth. And then at the same time, kind of on the outer circle, we have that external analysis where people are able to then see more of what's going on. The team, the, the community members that are kind of engaging can start to engage kind of in, in external content, more tailored experiences and, and so forth. We also are really excited to bring uh, the monetization of credentials into creds as well. The core premise of Checked and, and our, you know, our mission to execute on our vision is always that we need um, a way of monetizing and, and catalyzing this industry. And we believe it is through building commercial models. And so with creds, we'll be doing the same thing. We'll be offering opportunity to people for, to, to charge for the verification of credential and then also to purchase a credential as well. Finally, goal six, and then I'll hand over to Anka to share some exciting experiments, and then we'll, we'll try and get to questions. Um, so finally, offering collectors the opportunities to use their credentials. So the first one I said was around how collectors can aggregate more data. Then we've got how creators can find and engage with better members. And then finally, what's the benefit for the collectors? So what can they do with their credentials? So the first thing that we're really keen on is by building personalized experiences, by building people, by understanding our community members more, 
we can create experiences that actually matter more to them. And so if you think of kind of the traditional markets where people are getting in, in information of things that aren't necessarily as relevant to them, we want to be able to find and nurture the members. And to do that, we need to create tailored learning journeys that actually is, is in line with their experiences, what they care about, and basically what creds they hold. Likewise, we can give more relevant rewards. So in that kind of virtuous flywheel, if you understand your members more, then you can give a reward that matters to that person as an individual rather than sort of one size fits all rewards for everyone. And that's kind of the issue, which is, again, as I said, being shown time and time again within Web3, that one size fits all rewards is just creating civils and it's just creating, um, you know, really um, uncommitted and unloyal community members. And then finally, being able to provide like exclusive access, exclusive rewards and so forth by understanding your members better. We also see creds as a possible or a really good route to build a personal brand and a reputation. Currently, the opportunities out there, whether it's X, um, LinkedIn, all these different options um, allow you to kind of build your reputation and, and obviously share your jobs and share updates. But generally, most of that data is not verifiable. You cannot actually check whether that organization is, is the real organization. And although that's emerging in organizations like LinkedIn, we believe it's a real possibility here for particularly it's starting with web three communities and if web three individuals to be able to build their reputation one thing that we've had a lot at conferences that we've been to is people that have been working in web three for the last couple of years have struggled to to verify and, and demonstrate their brand because it's quite an intangible space but if you as a community member like our ones have shown that you've been committed to joining webinars you've been engaging in learning docs or you're a developer and you've been finding bugs and so forth you can build a reputation around that. And we also want to make it possible for people to build different reputations based on who they want to show. So on the left-hand side there, you can see my more personal reputation, which is just trying to show off that I love surfing, although I haven't managed to do that for quite a while recently. And then on the right-hand side, you can see more of my work profile. And being able to show those different profiles for different use cases it just gives you more um, control over your data and over your reputation, which, which goes back to the heart of what we're doing here. We also see a possibility of being able to use the way we're aggregating all that data. So we're aggregating that Web2 data and that Web3 data, being able to build a blended credit score. So being able to say, OK, this is what I've done in the Web2 space. This is kind of uh, my credit score, um, which is obviously known and people are generally very accustomed to Web2 credit scores. But what about a Web3 credit score? And this opens up some exciting opportunities within like emerging markets and a broad number of spaces for people who are very much daily um, involved in um, in using crypto to be able to build a rec credit score, gain access to loans and so forth. And so this is the space that we're, we're curious to kind of dig in deeper. And finally, one thing to, to bear in mind as well is how can you use um, creds for governance? One of the problems, again, a number of problems within kind of scamming within the Web3 space is that you tend to have the emergence of more and more sort of scam proposals and also proposals which are very much kind of just people clicking vote without really getting um, fully engaged in it. And scam proposals have proliferated. Again, this one's all about airdrop scams, which kind of goes back to the earlier point. So we're interested in showing how you can actually use creds as a way of managing and gating governance. And so with the creds based governance, and we've, we've had some cool conversations with a number of governance organizations on this, communities would be able to choose how they just how they customize the governance. And so it's not just state-based and, and anyone with tokens can vote, but you can decide whether on a vote, maybe it's 60% go to the community, 30% to the advisors, 20% to the ambassadors and so forth. So you can have a more programmatic choice of how you actually go about and, and choose governance. So that wraps up creds. I'm going to hand over to Anchor to run through our new category of experimental, which you'll find all of this in our roadmap as well, which we'll share the link for at the end. Um, so yeah, over to Anchor. Thanks, Ross, and thanks for that overview of all of the exciting stuff that we're doing across uh, CREDS, Checked Network, and our SaaS tools. Uh, so this section called Experimentation, we put it in here because we feel like we've got a lot of maturity on the identity standards. I answered some questions around how having, the, having a big tent approach where we support various different credential formats and use cases is been one of the earliest uh, principles within the company. Uh, but we are at the stage where we want to start looking at where could our technology be applied and, and almost leading the way uh, within that, as well as working with partners in going and achieving those. So first off, um, I think what we want to show is 
uh, how generative AI makes authenticity more desirable. I think there's a couple of pictures missing here. <laughs> I don't know why. Maybe Ross's um, thing is not updated. But just to give one example, um, this is a site called Only Fakes, where which is a defake website where you can go and generate realistic looking driver's licenses, passports from various different countries. And um, a lot of these will pass the KYC check that you need to go and onboard somewhere. The other two stories that I had called out over here were uh, there's a pretty big news story about somebody who got fooled into paying $25 million because there was a deep fake C CFO that joined their Zoom call. And it was hyper realistic. People could under people could not make out the difference within the company, and actually went and made ahead. Uh, went ahead with that transfer. And the last bit that I'd called up was uh, Taylor Swift, which uh, defects of Taylor Swift have been a big problem on on X slash Twitter to the extent that, like you know, X slash Twitter is probably getting sued at this point. And Thank so, you. I think yes. I just um closing and I just. Stop sharing and reshare so you get all the, yeah. all the information. I'm sure it's there. Let's just do it quickly. Um, cool. All right, back in business. Back in business. All right, perfect. Um, so I think that goes towards saying that, like, you know, with, with generative AI, both in text while somebody's messaging you or in video or in pictures, there's there's going to be a lot of um, work to look at, like, you know, what is what the, what is authentic or not. And uh, I think generative AI especially is, I think, going to raise a lot of those questions. So if you go across to the next slide to touch upon is where is where, where are verifiable credentials coming into the picture? So one clear answer, and this is a new story from quite literally yesterday or earlier within this week, is OpenAI is adding uh, new watermarks using the Content Authenticity Provenance Alliance, which uses verifiable credentials to DALI. Um, and that I think we'll start seeing a push both regulatorily as well as from the technology uh, companies themselves towards this push towards authenticity. And I think more broadly in generative AI, what we're quite interested in looking at is the process behind how you train a large language model or uh, any of the transformer-based models that are used for generative image generation. How could you uh, uh, approve that like, you know, they're, they're trained on authorized data sets or authentic data sets? As more and more text and image is online, start getting generated using generative AI. Um, the next generation of LLMs do have a problem on hand that they're getting trained on themselves or text or image that has been generated by themselves. So I think there's something there that we wanna explore. The second part of it is looking at opening up uh, creds.xyz. Obviously you can build solutions that are highly interoperable uh, design solutions um, for digital identity on the Czech network. But looking at like the superset of features that we've been building on creds.xyz, we want to open that up. But there's a couple of design principles that we're looking at. We want it to be flexible and developer friendly and uh, things that we like along that front, for example, would be Zapier or If This Then That. If you're a developer, you, you'd have seen these as highly engaging, um, highly flexible platforms that allow you to connect multiple services together. We almost want to have the same revolution uh, within digital identity and decentralized identity. The second piece of this is to make it secure but user-friendly. It's easy to make something flexible but developer-friendly if you're compromising on privacy. But the hard part is doing that in a secure yet user-friendly fashion. And the examples that we look forward to in that is uh, things like WhatsApp and Signal Protocol or 1Password, which is end-to-end -end encrypted and yet has a highly uh, secure and engaging uh, sort of like, you know, formats and factor. There was something of a discussion we were having within the team ourselves where um, I think the people, people 
to the, there's there's privacy extremists like myself on the team as well as people who are perhaps uh, not not as not as on the extreme and what people commented is that whatsapp is easy to use. need to actually understand the technology uh, to see how simple it is you don't need to understand the technology behind one password to see how easy and simple to use it is from a user perspective and so we want to bring some of that what that brings us to is how do we want to open it up so we want to if you go across to the next slides we want to look this is as uh, we said creds.xyz was your data your reputation portable private and secure and what we've been building last year so far is um, experiences or apps that we've been building ourselves internally. Um, so first off, as we said in goal one, we want to expand that to data aggregation. We want you to be able to have not just the community reputation that's been awarded by a community admin or somebody and a trustworthy individual within that community, but you want you to be able to uh, collate and aggregate all of your on-chain activity whether that be on Cosmos or other chains, as well as from traditional web 2.0 sources in a wallet that is portable, private, and secure that you control. And where does the portable part of this comes in? We will be building solutions ourselves, but we also want to open this up so that as a user, um, other developers are able to go and build solutions on top. Um, perhaps there will be examples of this where they get used in DeFi or centralized exchange applications like the Web3 credit score example that Ross was talking about, or reputation use cases like in generative AI. More, most importantly, we want to make this a flexible and secure API platform, a bit like here or if this and that, to go and handle all of those use cases that we can't even imagine or build ourselves and to open it up to interested parties. So this brings me um, to a bit of a personalization paradox to end off our, our journey um, of what we wanna explore this year. I think people um, use a lot of online services. They, they are constantly creeped out uh, they often ask questions like, "Are our phones listening?" Um, we and and the and and the sad thing is, Facebook doesn't even need to listen to us to get to the level of creepy personalization that it like you know gets to uh, gets to put out there. Um, and to the next part of the paradox is, people are creeped out by that, but yet they say they want more personalized experience. They say we want better ads. They say they tend to skip online ads when given the option. And yet, when they uh, are also asked about, would you like a personalized experience? Would you like targeted ads? They all go and say yes. And a lot of them still believe that they're getting that personalization right. So there's a bit of a paradox in there. Where we think verifiable credentials can come in, if you go on to the next slide, is that so far within the evolution of Web 2.0, we've been talking a lot about the experience economy. And I think we need to pivot that to the personal economy. What people feel is that they don't have enough control on their data. They like the personalization, but they don't have enough control on their data. And if we can achieve all of those using the same kind of end-to-end -end encrypted private and secure technology that we've all learned to love and adopt in the way uh, of services like WhatsApp and Signal and so on, there is, I think, a lot of um, value that we as checked and the products that we're building in creds.xyz can add to this. That was a long deep dive. We've covered a lot of ground. Um, we have a fair amount of time for questions. Uh, we've been answering some of them as we go along on the Zoom Q&A chat feature. So uh, yeah, over to anybody on the call to talk us through. One thing to mention about this, we are recording the call. You might have seen the recording symbol come up. Um, we will be publishing a recording of this. So anybody who hasn't been able to watch can, can play it back. And uh, if you don't feel like coming on video, I don't think you can come on video. Um, those parts of the conversation would be not recorded anyway. It's just on the presenter side. And so yeah, floors, floors over to the audience. Teresa, how do we take the floor to the audience? 
<laughs> hey, yes. So yeah, I'm from I'm Teresa here. Yeah. So as uh, you guys, uh, if you can ask in the Q and A uh, chat box, and then we can upgrade you to become a panelist and speak. Yeah. Brilliant. Okay. Oh, we've got we've got we've got a question here. So, um, one question. Um, let's go to Alex or Anger. I'll I'll read this out, and then why don't you go for it? So, question on EIDAS. Uh, does the potential of, of the election, um, a more right-wing digital ID suspicious EU parliament this year, lead to any risks that EIDAS may not happen? May not I, 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 I don't think, from my understanding of being in, in these circles, there's enough people in the, in the EU, in the commission, um, who are, you know, e either working on EPSI, either working on different large scale projects, either working on the like legislation itself. I think it's got to a point now where, where the, the final text has been formalized and it's a matter of time about uh, when it gets formally passed into law. It's not, I don't think it's a question of if, um, it's just a question of when now. So even if there was a change in government, I'd be incredibly shocked if all of this work was sacked off, um, given that there's been, I think it's like 80, 80 no, 40 billion pounds investment in digital ID from the EU for this strategy. Um, so I, I think it's going to go through, even with the change in the sort of political wing of the EU going forward. Um, that's my take on it anyway. Um, anyone, yeah. if anyone else wants to add to that. Fraser, do you want to go next? I think you have some thoughts about this from Inatpa. And I was going to say practically the same thing as Alex, which is there's a lot of momentum behind this and a uh, lot of um, individual EU countries that are taking the lead uh, don't have the same sort of like political influences happening within them. Um, so yeah, Fraser would be keen to hear your thoughts. Yeah, um, I think... For We've used it, we, we say this about quite a few things, but I think it's true here, which is like, digital ID and ID cards in, they already exist in Europe and quite a lot of the countries. Like obviously the UK is very, very different. And there was just a completely allergic reaction every time ID cards have been brought up. But a lot of, a, a lot, if not all of them, I wouldn't be able to speak authoritatively, like already, already have, um, ID cards, they're just physical. So moving them online, I don't think is that much of a stretch. And then to second Alex and Anka's point, I go to Inapa last week. Um, and that was with um yeah, that was with the um I was in DG Grow, which I can't remember what that stands for, and DG FISMA, which is more to do with like financial infrastructure. And there was just an open like it's not even spoken about that there is any risk to EIDAS. It is just, it's going to happen. Um, timelines may be flexible, like all government projects, but there's pretty much like an, a consensus that it is, it's just happening and things are being put, like being built out. There's pilots going on. Everyone's figuring out what adoption looks like. There's no like worrying about the political climate over the next couple of years. Maybe um, because there's not any questions, maybe let's just um, just like touch back on some of those questions that I got asked um, during, because I think there could be an interesting discussion for other, others that haven't seen it. So um, just just briefly, let's look at this. So one from Nikki was, how does standards support pr uh, promote differentiation? Surely it is the opposite of differentiation, or do you mean enabling check secret source while still being compliant? I know I, you've kind of covered that, but maybe just to share that with the, the group. The group. Yeah, sure. Um, I think it's a very good question. How does standard support give differentiation? I think our differentiator is that we go and support more of the standards. Um, and that has been one of the core principles right from the beginning um, to look at other digital ID solutions. And I think the industry has moved a lot. They're trying to recognize that interoperability points. And there's far more work being done right now on supporting multiple standards within the same products. Uh, but what we want to commit to is by going and uh, looking at some of the emerging things like selective disclosure jots, what this allows you to do, for example, is if you had a digital credential with 10 fields and you only wanted to go show two or three of them, you can do that, 
with selective disclosure jobs. So we we feel quite excited about that within um, creds. Uh, there's a way of like having done this in the past using Anon creds, but going and supporting the other major format that's been emerging, I think will help. The other part is um, I always think a bit of the SSI industry has been based around the conception that everybody will adopt SSI and then the world will change. But in practical terms, that might take many, many years to do. And there will always be early adopters and there will be companies or organizations or industries that come on board to this whole new paradigm at, at a slower space. Um, you only have to look at a government website to see how old technology <laughs> gets used sometimes. Um, so for example, on that front, OpenID Connect for verifiable credentials, it layers verifiable credentials with OpenID Connect, which is the login with Google, login with Facebook type technology that everybody already knows and is familiar with and going and supporting that. So I think that's our differentiation. We want to go and support as many of the standards, whether that be for exchange, whether that be for credential formats, and uh, that would be a differentiator. The other question was, I think, will Thanks. a presentation be shared? Yes, we will be publishing the recording. But I think we've had a few more yeah, questions coming more. in. So cool. Let's start with um yeah, thanks, Anka. So um yeah, so Chappie, thanks for joining. One of our very committed and loyal community members for right from the start, I think, or very close to. Um so Alex, this is one I know from your own quotes, close to your heart. What about trust registries? Is that something Czech feels um it has to work on, um, at least on its ecosystem? Yeah, so this is actually a really, really good question. Trust registries is something in the space that everyone agrees is a big item uh, to figure out, but nobody's come up with the perfect solution for it. And um, with an eye on EIDAS as well, what I think we're going to see is over the coming years, an interplay between uh, trust registries using traditional PKI and like X509 certificates as like a root of trust um, in combination with something like what we built on check with diddlinked resources for um, where basically diddlinked resources can can be used for trust registries and then the root of and then it can point to maybe an X509 certificate as the root of trust. I can't say what exactly I'm working on but I am looking to uh, push this as an idea with relevant stakeholders from uh, different industry consortia. Um, and I'm working closely with them to make sure that we use things like diddlinked resources for trust registries, and we almost standardize this as the best practice. I presented this at uh, IIW uh, last year uh, or two years ago. Um, and it's been something that I've been thinking about a lot. Currently at Checked, we do support trust registries just on the network. Um, so I think there's another question on verified creators. So this kind of ties really neatly into what we're doing on creds. But we want to basically use creds to demonstrate um, a really simple trust registry uh, or verified creators on the network. And I think one of the things that we would also look to do is um, have encrypted trust registries where you might need to pay to access the contents of a trust registry, um, which is a business model, which I think we've had a lot of interest in from uh, the community. Uh, so that was a bit of a roundabout way of saying, yes, I think trust registries are, so are incredibly important. And I am working tirelessly in the backgrounds to make sure that this is, that we are best placed to uh, basically enable the like trust registry is going forward in a like completely standardized way. My audio is being a bit choppy, but I'll extend that with the verified creators question that somebody asked uh, on questions as well. That is quite related to uh, trust registries. I think um, the other language that I've heard people start using about it instead of trust registries is acceptance networks. Um, which is quite interesting because that is exactly the terminology and the thing that we described uh, in my paper at Rebooting Web of Trust about like two years ago. Um, so it's, it, I'm, I'm glad like that there's 
we we built a solution about it and i i think it took a while for the industry to catch up and what we're seeing now is that like there's a lot more discussions and and conversations happening about trust registries acceptance frameworks our acceptance networks and uh, what we want to be looking at in terms of creds.xyz uh, the verified creator approval currently is manual but because we're trying to bootstrap the ecosystem of people who are using creds itself uh, but once we have got some momentum going there being able to use credentials themselves to automatically get verified creator status would be quite interesting and i think there's aspects of looking at web3 reputation scores or web3 credit scores or perhaps kyc credentials that are selective disclosure that could help us achieve that ross am i audible you are yeah <laughs> yeah that okay. was great right. yeah okay cool we've got another tassos joined us <laughs> <laughs> okay um hey matt welcome um Cool. So uh, let's go to another question. Um, so this one, again, it's on credential service. Um, are there more partnerships coming out for credential service? Um, Fraser or Alex, maybe either one of you could take that. Short answer is yes. Um, <clears throat> I, I mean, that's basically the answer to that is yes. Um, it's, it's quite cool. There's been a couple of messages I've seen in the background of, like, it's, it's always ongoing. There's always an ongoing pipeline and like, there's more people coming through um, and some very cool stuff that's kind of getting built out. So um, yeah, basically the short answer is yes. And looking forward to sharing those more as they actually come out, um, especially as there's some pretty cool stuff going on. Um, and the other thing is as well, um, these are the ones that we know about um, because credential service is now open and people can start using it. Like, yes, we track who is using it, but like, I don't know, every week that we look on, uh, on that list, there's more people and sometimes we don't recognize who they are and they need to start figuring out what they're up to and what they're building. Um, there's been some very, very cool stuff on there. So yeah, short answer is yes. Long answer is um, yes. And looking forward to sharing more about who they are and what they're up to as it comes out. Uh, Alex, I don't know if there's anything else you'd want to add. Yeah, so obviously we just released two big partnership announcements, one with Nexera ID, um, who are doing like compliance for onboarding to you know, centralized exchanges and other Web3 protocols, which is really cool. Um, I think, uh, and obviously Finclusive and Verida, and that all kind of works in a nice closed loop at the moment. But one of the things that I really see us doing in the next year is opening up credential service to all of the EU digital entity wallets. So we're already in conversations with multiple of them, uh, or if that makes sense. Um, and basically that's going to open our market up to just a lot of, basically our service a serviceable obtainable market will increase significantly with that um, integration into those wallets because then people who are in the eu ecosystem can start using our apis to issue to eu wallets and also start monetizing the credentials the other angle i think that we're going to start seeing partnerships on is the the, the payment scheme stuff, which I discussed earlier. Um, so I'm personally in conversations with multiple different existing payment schemes that are looking at, we want to take our business, well, we want to take our existing payment scheme, A, add a commercial model to it, because a lot of payment schemes don't have a commercial model, and B, transition it into the world of verifiable credentials in line with the upcoming EILS regs. Um, so basically working with those schemes, holding like basically uh, learning with them and building with them um, and making sure that we take all the boxes there. Um, I'm sure we'll have some cool stuff coming out in terms of the partnership announcements, but can't say any specifics on that. Brilliant. Thanks, Alex. Uh, I'm just going to interject before we come to the next question. Um, so with with creds in mind, I'm just going to drop in um, a couple of links. So one is the product roadmap link that should have just arrived into the um, into the messages from for all the attendees here. Um, so you can check that link out because there's a question that will come to you from Nikki shortly. And then additionally, um, while we're here, you can also claim your uh, your credential. Um, which basically says that you were here and in the future, maybe that will be our way of rewarding you as well. So you can claim that credential, the link I just shared there. 
Cool. All right. So we've got 10 more minutes left. Um, hopefully we can get through these last questions. Um, so before we come to Nikki's one, I think anchor Alex Fraser, check Tassos, check out that question and have a think of it while we do the next question as well. Um, so WRT, a focus on enterprise and identity, what support, if at all, for the VLEI um, will be available within checked credential service or creds? And how do you see the end game of organizational identities realizing new revenue flows for this ecosystem? I know this has been um, a few conversations that we've had internally with, with life and so forth. So um, who wants to take that question first? Yeah, I can take it. I had a yeah. chat with one of our advisors very recently about it. Um, I, I think the with the VLEI ecosystem, one of the core things that is necessary as an industry that over there is their uh, credentials are typically in a very specific format. It's a very rock and roll term, but it's mostly in ACDC, as they're called. Um, and... Uh, being able to convert that into something like open ID for verifiable credentials would perhaps be what's required to uh, make them available to the wider ecosystem. So one of the issues is uh, it's not a proprietary standard. It is an open standard, but it's an idiosyncratic standard. Um, that would be, in fact, a fantastic solution for onboarding uh, organizations into creds.xyz as verified creators and trying to start creating some of those acceptance networks. Um, so what I'm hoping for is more collaboration with the carry and the ACDC credential ecosystem to start bringing those into uh, other places. Yeah, just to touch on that a bit further as well, one of the cool things about carry is that you can run witnesses on the carry network, which basically allows you to extend your network functionality into the entire carry ecosystem is a bit like a plugin. Um, so what we are open to as well is uh, extending things like checked payment rails into the carry ecosystem to support paid VLEIs, uh, which I know is something that isn't currently on the roadmap for carry, but could be a really cool collaboration between us and uh, what they're building over there. And that would also bring some more harmonization between the approach to VLEIs on Kerry and also uh, you know, other trust registry approaches that are going on, for example, in the EU with things like EBSI Vector, which you can Google. Um, and yeah, hopefully if we become that bridge between the two, that would be a pretty strong play. Awesome. Um, thank you guys. I think, yep, yeah, good answer. Cool. Okay. We're going to do some improvisation now. I'm going to, um, pull up our new roadmap actually, um, because we're going to have a chat about it. I think this is a great question from Nikki. So, um, let me make sure I'm putting up the right link. Um, yeah, cool. Let's take a look at this together. Cause, um, is that showing the, showing the roadmap? Excellent. Cool. So this question has come from Nikki. Um, it's a very full and exciting roadmap. Thank you. Um, but it has it has good rationale and clear market need, but there is a lot there. Um, definitely. If you could only pick one item from each of network, creds and credential service, what would it be and why? And how are you prioritizing resources against roadmap item? Yeah, it's a brilliant question, Nikki, and one to definitely hold me to account as product manager. Um, whilst others think about it, I'm happy to to kind of jump in first with with my view on this and then um let's go to tassos and anchor next and fraser on the on the, the network side of things and then alex come to you on kind of standards ecosystem so for me i think looking at the roadmap i think the priority one of the highest kind of priorities is a blend of of the two that we have here i think exposing apis to integrate creds into other applications is what has the most upside for um for network effects for being able to bring in more, more organizations into creds and more issuers into creds um what we mean by this and, and what this item really is all about is basically saying within the studio right now which anyone of you can go and try just studio.creds.xyz anyone can get started they can log in they can build credentials in a really kind of no code -y, easy to use way where you never really know you're doing anything DID wise. Um, and you can issue credentials using CSV uploads, using the claim codes that we just dropped into the chat here. 
But the kind of the limitation with what that has is is scale, really. You have to have a community manager, which is always there. It's always kind of, um, you know, go through the process, creating new credentials and and issuing them the CSVs and stuff. What we imagine with this doing and, and how we want to approach this is basically having these APIs accessible within the studio. So somewhat of like a developer tab, which you would have seen in other applications before and making it easy for organizations and for developers, basically, to start building with creds. Um, and the, what we see that doing is it means that more applications can start um, integrating. There can be more creds issued and we can kind of see that kind of expanding emergence of different um, credentials. Um, so that's this one. In terms of kind of this, the second part of that question and how are you prioritizing resources, resources to do so? Um, we already have actually begun conversations. I actually spoke to um, our front end engineer, Gunjun, about this yesterday. And, and we've kind of had an initial conversation about basically how do we just bring in what we already have within our Swagger page, which is basically just a, a page with a list of APIs in it, bring that in and be able to bring that into the studio in quite a seamless way, in more of a proof of concept MVB type way. So it kind of, you know, developers as a persona, they can understand, they can engage with something which isn't really high fidelity and, and um, of that kind of type. So, so that's kind of the first step with this. I think I just will say, second most important for creds i think as well is the pay to verify and bringing in the the payments into that um anyone want to add anything to creds or has disagreements on on the creds creds one or we'll, we'll jump across to network next oh i'd have gone for the payments but i also agree with you i'd like as soon as you started speaking and you mentioned that one i actually came around to that um so i'm split between those two i like really split i think it's for me those are the two most exciting ones because and I, and I mean by just paying for either verification or buying a cred because um, to your point, like APIs enable everything at scale. There's a load of use cases we've spoken to people about whether like the studio is cool, but I would love an API to start issuing stuff. Um, the bit that I'm really excited about is the ability for people to charge for credentials or charge for creds when they're verified without having to, without needing to know anything about the code, which I think will be super, super cool. Um, so I think ultimately that's partly where NFTs are now and they've got their own flaws, but I think it'd be really cool to see something similar um, that people can just get started with without needing to know anything about the tech. And plus, yeah, show people don't tell. Brilliant. Also, uh, you know, I mean, we, we've had a pretty consistent track record of shipping almost everything that we have pitched in our product roadmap. <laughs> so uh, we feel confident of what the team can go and achieve and we balanced it within those parameters um, what you'll find is that a lot of the items that we called out very specifically are within sort of q1 q2 of this year uh, with a lot more time for experimentation in the later quarters so there's already some uh, con sort of uh, contingency or room for flexibility built in over there where we will go and test for product market fit for these solutions. I think on the network side, um, delivering the network upgrade itself, which will enable us to go cross chain and enable new kinds of tokenomics is probably the one that I would pick. But overall, uh, what we have here is within what you have seen, we, we've kept ourselves the room for that sort of like flexibility as the year evolves to go and narrow down and drill down on the bits that are finding product market fit. Brilliant. I know we've only got three minutes left. And I don't know whether the webinar just automatically ends. Tassos, anything from your side that you'd like to add additionally um, from the network side? Yeah, uh, probably just doubling down on the great itself, uh, just uh, bringing better foundations for uh, more advanced use cases, of course. Uh, enhancing and solidifying the current uh, functionality, but also allowing for orchestration of uh, on-chain actions with off-chain uh, verifiable data, which is uh, a quite experimental field, but we also think it's achievable, essentially, and one of its kinds. Brilliant. And uh, finally, Alex Fraser, where am I going on the roadmap for your, your top feature? Oh, I'd, I mean, if I'd have actually been down with, like, I think, Tassos' stuff around the on-ledger, like all the on-ledger stuff I find fascinating because it's got, for me, it's the one that has the biggest potential impact across across everything. So 
a, a blend of the um like the upgrade um what that means that NimLab can do with on-chain proofs, all that kind of good stuff. But also then you're into like fee abstraction, the fact that we can have check tokens burnt and people are using other tokens that they have, but then it's resolving to check under the hood and all that payment stuff just works. Um, I think all of that is extremely cool. And a lot of it is stuff that like not many other networks have done. And I think will be, and especially if we get that kind of EIP 115 style burn, all of that together, I think, is going to be super, super cool. So, yeah, that kind of stuff all together. Brilliant. And to wrap things, Alex, credential service. Yeah, there, there was a question in the chat, which was like, um, have you got more interest in having credential payments in cryptocurrency or in fiat? And I think this touches on what my most valuable point would be for credential service. And it's like it, both both have been really in demand. I think for Web3 organizations, settlement in check is like perfectly fine or settlement in any other token is perfectly fine. Whereas for more uh, like traditional industries, they want settlement in either a stable coin or fiat. So building that flexibility um, through the schemes, through fee abstraction um, and having those customizable commercial models baked into credential service I think will enable any uh, Web2 company or Web3 company to spin up credential payments and start using it. And for me, that's probably the biggest the biggest one for the for this year. Brilliant. And there was one final question I'll quickly take, which I think came off the back of um, one of the one of the items that Fraser and I just talked through um, around like expanding for paying for a cred. So it was specifically within creds. We are really like keen to see where people take this. Examples include you could pay for a cred to be um, to become a member. Some some memberships like memberships of DAOs and things require a payment to be actually become a member. So I would pay for that credential, and then in return I would get that credential, which then gives me access. Um, so I guess like an access credential payment. Um, tickets, another example of that. Um, but then it could evolve into, I guess, starts to look somewhat similar to kind of part of the NFT space where you could have people paying for, um, you know, different pieces of art or, or things. So we're kind of like wanting to get it out to market because it's actually very exciting to see the use cases that evolve that are much beyond our imaginations because, you know, we, we understand some things, but yeah, there's much more to them. Fraser, anything you wanted to add on that? No, I don't totally agree. I think that's going to be the fun part is um, just the unknown unknowns. It's just getting it out there. And we've, like you were saying, we've got a bunch of use cases. Some of that is similar stuff to like um, what Penclusive are doing around KYC. There's other use cases look at payments like ESG credentials, all that kind of stuff. But there's probably a load of use cases that we just don't know about because we just aren't in those industries. Um, yeah, so... I think just looking forward to seeing how that shows out. And um, I guess just, a, I think we mentioned it at the top of the call, but um, obviously this, I think one of the questions which I answered in text was that um, obviously this is being recorded. Um, it will be uploaded. So it'll have all the materials in it. Um, we got quite a few messages from partners saying, love to attend, but client calls. Um, so make sure it's recorded and, and sent out. So um, there'll be a web, like it's all been recorded. Um, we'll get it up and, and uploaded. Not entirely sure how quick that will be. That'll be over to Eduardo and Teresa, but yeah, just want to mention that definitely all recorded and would definitely be shared out afterwards as well. Yeah, thanks, Fraser. Um, well, yeah, and on that note, um, yeah, two minutes over, so yeah, we'll be, we'll take that. That's not too bad. And uh, thanks everyone for joining. Um, we're really looking forward to the year ahead. Looking forward to kind of answering any other questions, obviously within Telegram, our Slack community. Um, on Twitter, wherever you X, wherever you want to kind of chat with us. And yeah, thanks for joining. Thanks for the great questions. Um, I think we'll we'll wrap up there. Yeah, thanks everyone. Thanks everyone. Hopefully, see you soon. It's really cool. Thanks all.